Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> the laureates this year, Serge Aros and David Weinlein, work in a very active research field called quantum optics. In this field of physics, fundamental interactions between light and matter are studied. In fact, interaction between light and particles, the light particle, photons and matter, is the reason why you can see me standing here. The Nobel Committee has especially singled out groundbreaking inventions made by the laureates that has led to the possibility to measure and control individual quantum systems. Dreams of such studies have been around since the dawn of quantum physics, but has become a reality fast now. Their methods have in fact many things in common. David Wanland traps electrically charged atoms called ions controlling and measuring them with photons, which are the particles of light. Serge Arroche, on the other hand, takes the opposite approach. He controls and measures trapped photons by sending specially prepared atoms through the trap, where the atom acts as spies, giving information about the photons without destroying them. Their work has opened up a new era of experimental possibilities. In their experiments, they study fundamental questions in quantum physics like the transition towards a classical world called decoherence. One application is the realization of the most precise clocks ever seen. And this year's prize has actually also paid the way towards future quantum computers, computers with performances that would be a dream for computer science. And the two lords has also another thing in common. They like the same cat. Uh, no, no, sorry, I, I, I said this wrong. They liked the same cat. No, no, I'm wrong again. They like the same cat. Or maybe they like and like the same cat at the same time. I cannot find out, so we have to hear them about that. So, we start these lectures with, with Sarah Arosh. He was born in 1944 in Casablanca in Morocco. He got his PhD in 1971 from the University of Pierre and Marie Curie, Paris, France. He is professor at Collège de France and École Normale Supérieure Paris in France. And uh, now I give the word to Professor Roche. Quantum physics has revealed that matter and light uh, can have a particle and a wave-like character at once. Atoms, which are usually described as discrete entities, can also behave as matter waves. And light, which is usually described as an electromagnetic wave, is made of single particle, discrete particles of photons. This duality has led to a strange world in which atoms and light fields can uh, exist in state superposition, so to speak, suspended between different classical realities. The fathers of quantum physics, which have discovered these uh, laws by uh, observing properties of matter and radiation, which could not be explained by classical physics, were not able, at the time they were uh, founding the theory, to observe directly this strange behavior on particles of light or matter. So they imagined thought experiments. For instance, Bohr and Einstein, in their discussions, uh, imagined that they would be able to trap single particles, for instance, single photons. You see here the famous photon box that Bohr uh, drawed uh, when discussing with Einstein, in which a photon would be stored and then released on demand through this shutter. And you see that uh, the experiment was not real, but Bohr drew it with uh, exquisite precision. And you see that there is a clock here which plays an important role in the experiment. I will come back to this later. But at the time they were thinking about these experiments, Einstein, Bohr, and Schrodinger did not believe that such experiments would one day become possible. Of course, they knew, and Schrodinger knew in the 1950s, that single particles could be detected. But the detection occurred 
by destroying the particles. You see here an example of the traces in a bubble chamber. Uh, also in accelerators, when particles collide, you see the debris of the collision after the particle has been destroyed. So, in fact, it was post-mortem physics. The objects were destroyed uh, while being observed. And Schrodinger put it in a very nice way when he said, it is fair to state that we are not experimenting with single particles any more that we can raise ichthyosauria, I don't, I'm not sure I pronounce correctly, in the zoo. We are scrutinizing records of events long after they have happened. So particles exist, but it's difficult to have them in a zoo. But things have changed since then, and now we are performing these thought experiments. They have become real, and we can control a zoo of particles make tame them and observe them. And this has become possible due to the development of new quantum technology. First of all, tunable lasers, which allow us to explore with very high precision the structure of atoms and also to manipulate atoms. You also need fast computers to analyze the data and to take in real time the data provided by the experiments. And in some cases, you need also superconducting technology to have mirrors which will hold the photons, the particle of light, long enough. And I think it is interesting to note that these uh, uh, technological uh, inventions are all born from quantum physics. So it's a very nice circle which is closing here. From quantum theory, you get quantum technology which enables us now to demonstrate directly the strangeness of the quantum world. So many experimentalists in the world are now working in this field called quantum optics or quantum information, and they are able to tame this particle in, real, in the real world. Uh, this year, Swedish Academy of Sciences, as we uh, just heard, has decided to, uh, uh, to just to, to put this field forward by uh, giving the prize, the Nobel Prize in Physics to David Wang and myself. But, uh, I am sure he agrees with me that we are just here as a representative. We are representing a very wide field of physicists, and I am very glad to see that many of them uh, working in labs in the world are here today. It has also been pointed out that the experiments that we are doing in Paris and the one which are done in Boulder are very similar. They are the two sides of the same coin. While uh, Dave in Boulder is uh, manipulating single atoms with photons. We in Paris manipulate single photons with atoms, and we both do it in vivo, as opposed to the post-mortem physics that we were talking about before. Now, just to show you the analogy between these two kinds of experiments, I will show you a figures, fig two figures which, have been, which are taken from two papers which have been published back to back in 1996. In our group in Paris, we uh, detected the signature of an atom oscillating, an, an atom coupled to an oscillating electromagnetic field in a trap. And at the same time, in Boulder, Dave Groups was observing the same signature from an ion oscillating in his trap. Technically, these oscillations are, are called Rabi oscillations but you don't have to know anything about them to recognize that there is a strong similarity between these two kinds of signals. It is at that time in 1996 that uh, Dave and I and our wives Claudine and Sedna became very good friends. And it turned out that uh, they came, uh, Dave and Sedna came to Europe for a conference and Claudine and I uh, took this opportunity to distract Dave from his research not really because we wanted to slow him down in our competition, but because I think we wanted to uh, open them to the pleasures of uh, European and, more specifically, uh, the French vacation, vacation concept, which seems to be absent in the United States. So <laughs> you see here a picture which was taken in the Boboli gar Gardens in Florence in August 1996, and this is a testimony of the fact that Dave is not always working. <laughs> so, but the story about uh, taming atoms and photons started much before. And Dave will tell you about his part of the story. I will tell you about mine, which started in the 1960s. I performed my PhD uh, thesis with Claude Cointanuji, and uh, I was working at that time 
on optical pumping experiments, learning that lasers could be used to manipulate atoms, and also on the dressed atom formalism, it, which is a formalism which uses quantized, which quantized the electromagnetic field to understand better its interaction with matter. And I remember that at my thesis committee, uh, one member of the committee, Anatola Bragam, <coughs> who has a very abrasive mind, asked me, why do you quantize the field? You are working with classical fields. You have zillions of photons. You don't need to do that. I don't remember what I answered to him, but in retrospect, I could have told him, one day, sir, I will be working with a single photon, and then I would need this dress atom approach. After my thesis, I went to, for, for a postdoc with Arthur Shallow in 1993, and then I learned to work with dye lasers, which were developing there, and I did quantum bit studies. Quantum bits involve exciting atoms and looking at the time evolution of state superposition. So I started at that time to work on this concept of state superposition. I just want to mention that these uh, uh, two uh, gentlemen got the Nobel Prize in Physics in the year 97-81, and I remember that 15 years ago, I was in this room, but on the other side of, of the stage, and I am very moved to see that Claude is here today and that we exchange our roles. Uh, so, <laughs> it's very nice. So, <laughs> but the story really started uh, some time later in the 1970s when I came back from Stanford and I started to use dye lasers to excite Rydberg atoms, very excited atomic states. And you know, they, this week in, Sw in Sweden is full of surprises. I just met a few minutes ago the grandson of Rydberg who is attending to this lecture, so I'm very pleased about that. So Rydberg developed, uh, gave the formula which explains the, the, the physical prop, the, the spectrum of these states, and we start to investigate them with our system, which was very simple. We had an atomic beam, which was crossed by lasers, tunable lasers, and they were exciting Rydberg atoms. And at the same time, we were irradiating these atoms with microwaves, which were confined in an open cavity made of copper mirrors. And so we are looking at the microwave absorption, which, to which these atoms are exceedingly sensitive. So we are very interested in this very high sensitivity. After the atom left the cavity, they went in this zone where they were ionized between two condenser plates, and they were ionized at different times because the field increased in a ramp. And in this way, we were able to discriminate the signature of the upper and the lower state. And this is a technique that we are using to this day to detect very efficiently Rydberg state and transition between Rydberg states. So when we did that, we observed something which at first was very strange. We saw that if the atom was initially excited and if the cavity was tuned on resonance, we did not need to apply any microwave. The system was undergoing a fast transition from the upper to the lower state spontaneously and we recognized that we had built a maser, a transient microwave maser. But what was surprising is that the threshold of this maser was exceedingly low. We had only a few thousand atoms in the sample, as opposed to ordinary laser or maser system, which require billions of atoms. So at the end of the paper that we wrote at that time, we made a comment uh, saying that by increasing the Q factor of the cavity, we could go to very small absolute atom numbers. And in fact, it was the start of our hunt towards single particle physics. And this field, which studies the interaction of atoms with fields uh, within cavities, is now known as cavity quantum electrodynamics. So we kept increasing the Q factor of our cavity, and one way to do it was to go to uh, superconducting mirrors. So we replaced our copper mirrors by superconductive niobium mirror at very low temperature, and then we were indeed able to increase uh, the Q of the cavity and to decrease the threshold up to the point where we got single clicks in our detectors and we observed the fast transfer of a single atom from the upper to the lower level, and which is the transient regime of a laser, and it's an effect which was predicted by Ed Purcell in 1945. But we still were not satisfied because the Q of our cavity was not big enough for the field to be able to stay in the cavity long enough to be reabsorbed by the atoms. 
And what we wanted to realize is this regime of quantum mechanical oscillation between a two-level atom and a single field mode, which is called now the strong coupling regime of cavity QED. So we went on a hunt to get to the strong coupling regime, which became our holy grail. And we tried to improve the cavity factor. So it was a very exciting time in our lab, and I found a few pictures uh, of this time. This is me with my first two graduate students, uh, Michel Gross and Claude Fab, back to the camera in our office. And here you see uh, Philippe Goua, who is a specialist of uh, solid state physicist who was working in the uh, uh, next, next lab and uh, who is a wizard in microwave technology. And he developed all the microwave sources and microwave uh, analyzers that we use up to this day. So his collaboration has been essential to the success of our work. On this last picture, you see facing me, uh, here you have Claude Fab and uh, Kaluzny, and facing me, Jean-Michel Raymond, in, I think in 1980. And I'm glad that we stayed together and worked in the same, on the same project since then. So uh, we were at a loss to increase the Q of our cavity at that time. Niobium was fine as a superconductor, but it's a very poor material to be machined, and so the surface of our mirrors were not smooth enough, and the photons were scattered out. And so we were trying to do something better when we heard from Munich that Herbert Walter has succeeded to reach our holy grail, uh, getting into the strong coupling of, uh, regime of cavity QED. Uh, and so he achieved that before us, and it was uh, at the same time, we were uh, very uh, admirative of his work, but we were a little bit worried that we were uh, behind. In fact, he had a very bright idea with his student, Dieter Mechede. He replaced the, the open cavity by a closed cylinder, and then the quality of the inner surface does not matter anymore, and he could increase the photon lifetime in his cavities by two to three orders of magnitude. And what they built is a micro a device where atoms go through the cavity one by one, and the field build up in a, builds up in a cavity in a steady state. This micro physics has been very successful in the 1980s and 1990s. And Dieter Meschede uh, became a postdoc of mine when, for, during the few years I was working part-time at Yale University, and then he came back and became a professor in Bonn, and he's doing now very beautiful experiments on cold atoms and quantum information, and we have been keeping exchanging students and postdocs over the years, and it has been a very fruitful collaboration. But so we witnessed these developments, and uh, we wondered whether we should go to closed cavities, but we still decided it was better to stick to open cavities because this closed cavity had a problem. The photon lifetime is very long, but you see that the atoms have to get very close to the surface of the metal because they have to go through very small holes. And the atomic superpositions are very sensitive to stray electric fields uh, close to the holes. So in this experiment, it's very difficult to control the atomic state and hence the field inside. So we decided we really had to go on with our open cavities. And it took us about 20 years to develop the technology which enabled us to get open cavity with the same kind of cue as these ones. So, and, this, and this led us to the experiments which bring me here today. But to describe these experiments, I think I will switch from the historical description to something which will be more deductive and, and uh, uh, in emphasizing the physics rather than history. But I have to start with the first point. Usually when you talk about detecting light, you use the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect, which was uh, uh, described first by Einstein in 905, destroys the photons. What you have when photons impinge on a sensitive detector, your retina or a, a photosensitive uh, cathode, you get clicks which show that the photons have been there, but the click destroys the photons. So you have a photon, and after the click, you have zero photons. The photon is gone. So this is not so much different from the brute force experiments I described to you before. In fact, what you're observing with your eyes or with any kind of detector are the debris of collisions of the photon with a photosensitive surface. And this is not what you want if you want to detect photons in vivo. What you want instead is a situation where one click leaves you the photon inside uh, your system 
and so that you would be able to repeat the experiments again and again. And this is called a quantum non-demolition measurement. And it was pioneered, the theory of this uh, kind of experiment was pioneered by Vladimir Braginsky back in the 1970s. But to achieve that, you need two uh, ingredients. You need first a non-demolition detector which works without absorbing the photon, but which is sensitive at a single photon level. And you also need a very good box to keep the photons long enough. And so we are back to the photon box that I discussed in the thought experiment of Einstein and Bohr. And the photon box we came up upon is shown here. In fact, what we did during these 20 years was to improve the surface of our mirrors. And uh, the Q of the cavity increased progressively. It went into the 100 microsecond domain in the 1990s, which allowed us to do some experiments. And then in the hundreds of milliseconds in the, in the years 2000, and the, the final idea was to use uh, mirrors, spherical mirrors, made out of copper, because copper can be machined very precisely. And on this copper surface, we sputtered a little bit of niobium. So we took advantage of the mechanical quality of copper and the electrical quality of niobium. And then we were able to get mirrors on which light can bounce more than a billion times making a folded journey for the photon of 40,000 kilometers and giving a lifetime of 130 milliseconds to the photon, which allows many atoms to cross the cavity one by one, to extract information from the cavity field, and uh, to perform experiments in which we control the photons in vivo inside the cavity. But of course, for that, we need special atoms. And the second point is what kind of atom we are using we use Rydberg atoms, but, and here is a picture of Rydberg, but uh, we use special Rydberg atoms called circular ones. A circular Rydberg atom is an atom in which, uh, by a succession of laser and radio frequency excitation, you promote one electron to a very large circular orbit, which is a thousand times bigger than the orbit of the ground state. The techniques, with technologies that we used for uh, doing uh, this kind of experiment was uh, uh, following the ideas of uh, Dan Kleppner, uh, who, who developed it in 1983. And I want here to acknowledge Dan's uh, importance for this physics, not only because of his impact on Rydberg atom physics, but also because he was very important at the beginning of cavity QED. And for instance, he performed experiments on the inhibition of spontaneous emission between mirrors. Uh, and I think that at the beginning of cavity QED, the microwave domain, both uh, Dan Kleppner and Herbert Walter, who uh, sadly died in 2006, have been really pioneers, and I think they should be acknowledged both in this context. Uh, if you want to understand how this atom behaves, you have to remember that electrons are also waves, and so what you have is a De Broglie wave going around the circle, and the principal quantum number of this excited state is just the integral number of waves which are, uh, can be uh, put inside the circular orbit. And each of these eigenstates, energy eigenstates, has a circular wave going around, which is completely delocalized. You have the same density all around, which means that the system has no electric dipole. But if you want to couple to light, you need an electric dipole. And the way to get an electric dipole is to go into state superpositions. If a pulse of microwave realizes a superposition of two adjacent states with principal quantum number 51 and 50, you prepare a superposition of these two states, which, uh, if you wish, you could call a Schrodinger kitten. It's like Schrodinger's cat, which is suspended between life and death, states E and G, but of course a very small cat because it's just a single particle. So we can prepare this kind of system, and when you do that, the two waves, which are 50 and 51 nodes, interfere constructively at one end of the orbit and destructively at the other end, and now you get a big dipole rotating at 51 gigahertz. This dipole is like the hand of a clock, and in fact what we have built here is, a, what we are doing here is the building of a Rydberg clock which is ticking at 51 gigahertz, and we will use this clock to measure light non-destructively. The important point is that uh, the atom will be slightly detuned from the cavity so that the photons will not be absorbed or emitted in the cavity, but still there will be an effect. And this brings me back to the contribution of Claude, 
who in, uh, discovered in 1961 that non-resonant light modifies slightly the energy level. These are the light shifts that, which have had a tremendous importance in all kinds of atomic physics and quantum optics experiments during the last 30 years. In our field, what happens is that when the atom crosses the cavity, the energy levels are slightly shifted upwards and downwards, which means that the phase accumulation of the atom going between uh, uh, the mirrors is different depending upon the intensity of the field. And the effect is so sensitive that you can get a phase shift per photon phi naught as large as pi, 180 degrees. This means that whether you have zero or one photon in the cavity, uh, the dipole will point in one direction or in the opposite direction. And if you are able to measure the phase of this dipole, you will count photons without destroying them. Of course, if you want to me measure a phase, you need an interferometer. So we built around our cavity an interferometer which is made of two auxiliary microwave zones, R1 and R2, in which we apply pulses of microwave before the atom enters the cavity and after the atom leaves the cavity. The first pulse prepares a state superposition which starts ticking, and the second pulse is a flash of microwave which allows us to analyze the phase of the superposition. This succession of time-resolved pulses is known as a Ramsey interferometer. It was introduced by Ramsey in 1949, and it became the standard device of atomic clocks. I note that Ramsey was Dave Wineland's PhD advisor, so you see that our story is entangled in many ways. So we use this, this setup, and with this setup, we were able to detect single photons. In fact, if you have a phase shift of pi per photon, what the second Ramsey zone does is to map the two dipole states which are opposite into states E and G, which are finally detected in the detector. And you get, so what we have built is an atomic clock which is delayed by the photons which are tra trapped inside the clock. Uh, I am a little bit ashamed to talk to you about an atomic clock which has an accuracy of 10 minus 7 because Dave will talk about clocks which have an accuracy of 10 minus 17. But his clocks are, I must say, insensitive to light, which is not interesting to us. We want to have a clock which is very sensitive to light, and so we use red bag atoms. So uh, you see here is a kind of signal. A, a blue uh, bar means an atom in level G, a red bar an atom in level E, and you see in real time the kind of observation we get. And when we got for the first time this, this signal, we were really very excited. You see here that you have a jump. Here it means that you have zero photon in the cavity, one photon, and then back zero photon. And this photon is just a black body photon. The cavity is very cold, and from time to time, due to Planck's law, one photon pops in the cavity and goes out, and we measure this. And we see exactly the time when the quantum jumps, the sudden change of uh, the light field occurs here. These quantum jumps, by the way, were predicted by quantum theory long ago, but in spite of that, people like Schrodinger did not believe in them. The, the quotation I gave you in the beginning comes from an article whose title is very uh, 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 speaking for him itself. He says, are they quantum gems? So these are quantum gems observed with light, and Dave will show you in his talk quantum gems occurring in single ions, which had been observed 20 years before we did our experiment on light. But this was the first time the quantum jumps were observed on light. You see also that hundreds of atoms see the same photon. The, the atoms cross the cavity one by one and they all agree that there is a photon inside, so it's really non-destructive. We could extend also this experiment to measure higher photon numbers. Then, of course, a single atom is not enough. You have to send a sequence of atoms and each atom uh, extract a little bit of information. At the start of the experiment, we inject a small microwave, classical microwave field in the cavity, we don't know how many photons they are in, so the histogram is flat. You, the, the probability of having from zero to seven photons uh, is uniform. And as you will see, the computer which is uh, hooked to uh, the experiment uh, will show that uh, this probability as you acquire information changes in time. And after a few tens of atoms have crossed the cavity, one photon number suddenly emerges and survives. Here, five photons. And we were very excited when we saw this for the first time because this is under your eyes. 
the collapse of the wave function. You start with a system which is in superposition of photon number states, and in the end, by the way of acquiring information, the system collapses into a given number. These experiments, of course, emphasize the particle aspect of light. As I told you before, uh, uh, so uh, maybe first I should add something. We could follow on a longer time scale what happens to the field once it has been prepared in a Fox state, and you see here the quantum jumps of a field initially containing four or seven photons. And very recently, we are able to do something more than that, not only to observe the field, but to react back on the field and to preserve the field into a given photon number. You see here that we can stabilize the field either in a state containing four photons or seven photons. This is called quantum feedback because it is an extension to the quant to quantum systems of the classical feedback method which are used to stabilize a classical quantity. You just you observe and correct for changes. Here we correct for changes, for instance, by injecting one photon or subtracting one photon on demand. But as I just said, uh, we want now to explore the wave nature of this photon in the cavity. And uh, this duality between wave and particles uh, is, uh, of course, one of the deepest aspects of quantum theory, and Bohr emphasized the point that which aspect is observed depends upon the kind of experiment you are doing. And this is a metaphor here. You, if you can read this ambigram, either as light is a wave or as light is a particle, depending upon your state of mind. So I want now, and this ambigram is, is has been uh, drawn by Douglas Hofstadter. What I want you now to get into the frame of mind telling that light is a wave. And this will lead us to the discussion of Schrodinger's cat. Uh, I remind you the story, and uh, you know it, you have a big, anim big object, an animal in a box, an atom in a linear superposition of two states. One state uh, leaves the animal alive, and the other state uh, uh, triggers a, a contraption which kills the animal. And if you are halfway uh, between the excited and the lower state, you get an entangled superposition with a cat which is half dead and half alive in a quantum superposition. In our version of the experiment, we still have one atom, but we replace this cat not because we uh, don't want to make a cruel experiment, but because uh, we cannot do it on a large system. We replace it by a system made of a few photons. And we, uh, to, that, to understand that, I have to give you just one piece of theory here, a, a classical field, a field which has a well-defined phase and amplitude, which is produced by a classical source, is a, classically a point in phase space. It's a complex number which has an amplitude and a direction. According to quantum laws, it cannot be a point. You have quantum uncertainty, and in fact, it's a fuzzy ball here, which has a Gaussian distribution. This Gaussian distribution contains all the information you want to have about the field. Technically, it's called a Wigner function. It's a 2D real function which describes the state of the field. So you can prepare these states very easily. And then by sending Rydberg atoms through the cavity, you can manipulate this Wigner function into other shapes. And one thing we did uh, 20 years ago with our colleagues, uh, Luis Davidovich and Nisim Zaguri from Brazil, was to find out that the same setup which was used to measure uh, uh, non-destructively the photons could be used with a single atom to prepare a Schrodinger cat state. A superposition of two feeds of opposite phase, one would be the live cat, the other one the dead cat, and in between fringes which describe the superposition. This kind of situation is quite different from a statistical mixture, the fact that you have a live or a dead cat, you don't know which, but without this superposition. This is a classical state and this is a quantum state. So we described in this paper how to build these quantum states and in fact we are able to do it in a very simple way. It's again our Ramsey interferometer. We start by preparing a, a field in the cavity. Then we send a single atom, prepare it in a superposition of state. This atom crosses the cavity and it imparts to uh, the field a phase shift which takes opposite signs depending upon whether the atom is in the upper and the lower state. So you get at this point an entangled state. This entangled state is a typical schrodinger cat situation, and you can also look at it as a typical measurement situation. This uh, state is a kind of meter which points in different directions.
it happens in all measurements. So you get an entanglement in the measurement. And then the atom crosses the second zone, and the second zone mixes the states again, which maintains the cat's ambiguity. And in the end, when you detect the atom in one state or the other, you project the field into a cat. So I don't have time to enter into the details, but we can reconstruct the Wigner function of this cat by sending subsequent atoms across the cavity uh, by a modified version of the QND measurement and repeating the measurement many, many times and many, many copies, we can reconstruct the Schrodinger cat, and this is an experimental cat. You see the two bumps which represent the live and dead animal, and also the quantum interferences in between. This cat has about 2.5 photons on average, and since then we have made slightly larger cats, but you see we are still very far from having a macroscopic system. Furthermore, these superpositions are very fragile. Uh, the coupling to the environment washes out these uh, uh, features and transforms the cat very quickly into a mundane uh, uh, state mixture. The people, uh, uh, the, the person who uh, described the theory and the role of the environment in the transformation of the cat from a superposition into a mixture is Wojciech Zurek from Los Alamos, and we were inspired by his theoretical work to do our experiments. And you see here that you can indeed see how the Wigner function evolves by taking snapshots of these Wigner functions at increasing times, and you see how the cat evaporates, how the quantum uh, nature of the cat evaporates with time. This experiment can be seen as an exploration of the boundary between the quantum world, where quantum state superposition exists, and the classical world. Uh, an earlier version of the experiment done uh, 15 years ago with a cavity which was not as good had, also, had already revealed that the coherence of the cat decays and it decays faster when the distance between the two states of the superposition is increased. I think at this point I want to conclude by making some connections with uh, more recent developments. Here I'm talking about Rydberg atoms and microwaves in superconducting cavities but you have had also a very beautiful experiment which started in the 1980s in the optical domain. The cavity is then much smaller, dielectric mirrors, and cold atoms cross the cavity, and the interaction of these cold atoms with these optical cavities or microchips has led to very interesting experiments, the pioneers being uh, Kimball in Caltech and Gerd Rampe in Munich. In other developments, you can replace the cavities by the evanescent field in a whispering gallery mode of a microsphere or a microtoroid, and again, beautiful experiments have been done. In solid state physics, you can embed quantum dots between Bragg layers and again get cavity QD uh, going on. And last but not least, there have been a very important development lately called circuit QED, in which artificial atoms, which are small circuits with different junctions, are uh, coupled to uh, coplanar lines or 3D photon boxes uh, uh, in the radio frequency domain, and this, these systems, which are now studied in many laboratories in the world, are very similar to our microwave cavity experiments. And in fact, a lot of uh, beautiful experiments preparing Fox states, Schrodinger cat states, or doing quantum informations are now being developed with this system in circuit QED. I just give you an example. This is our cat in cavity QED, and this is a similar cat obtained at Yale uh, University this year, uh, uh, you see that you, see you have exactly the same kind of physics. The difference is that in circuit QED, things go much faster, so you can accumulate data faster, and also you can maybe integrate better the, 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 the two-level systems uh, together because you can use lithographic techniques which are uh, very convenient, and so this is a very, uh, maybe a very useful uh, device for quantum information, but I leave the discussion about quantum information to Dave Weinland. I want now to uh, make a few personal remarks, if I may, using two or three minutes for that. I, I want first to emphasize that all this has been uh, a collective adventure. I have been working, as I already said, for a very long time with Jean-Michel Raymond and for more than 20 years with Michel Brune, and nothing would have been possible without this long-term collaboration. We uh, directed the group together. We had this long discussion, decided in which direction we wanted to go. We uh, made, uh, uh, Jean-Michel and Michel made many seminal contributions to the understanding of the system, 
and uh, it's quite clear that uh, it would not have worked without them. So I think uh, they deserve to share the honor of the prize uh, with me on, on, on this part of the prize. I also uh, want to say that, of course, we are not alone. We, had, we have counted more than 100 people during the last 30 years, students, postdocs, and visitors, and this is the last generation, the people who gathered on October 10th of this year. And I want to mention especially uh, uh, Igor Dotsenko and Sebastian Glaze, uh, two young researchers who played a very important role in the last uh, series of experiments that I described to you. I also want to say that all this uh, 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 came uh, also through collaboration with people from outside. And I'm very glad here to see that you have a lot of people with whom we have been working uh, in the world who are uh, around, who are in this room. Uh, I think it's a privilege of our profession, of our, it's not a profession, of our passion, to be able to meet people everywhere in the world who share the same ideals, the same, the same uh, uh, wish to find, uh, by just mere curiosity, uh, new things about nature, and this really has nourished us. I want also to finish by uh, talking about the place where this research has been doing, and I want to say that the spirit of freedom uh, which I enjoyed and which our group enjoyed uh, comes back to uh, the legacy of Alfred Kastler and Jean Brossel, who created the lab in the 1950s. And you see, this picture was taken exactly in the same room as the previous one, but 46 years earlier, on the day that Alfred Kastler Nobel Prize was announced. As you can see, uh, uh, Claude and I looked different <laughs> from outside, but I think he agrees that uh, inside, our mi I don't see the difference in our minds. Now, uh, to conclude with even more personal remarks, of course, uh, I have a thought for my parents and for all uh, the people who are no longer here and who have uh, really enjoyed this, this time. But uh, I want also to add that more than everything else, nothing would have been possible without Claudine, with whom I have uh, shared all these years. And I must say that uh, I don't say if I should say her or you, her mind and her intelligence and her sense of humor have been really fueling me during all these years and uh, this goes much beyond science and physics and we have known each other much before I knew anything about photons. In fact, we met uh, when we were very young and then there was this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know how you call it, uh, 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 an interruption of many years uh, and the circumstances of life made that we uh, uh, encountered again. At the time, I was, uh, I was like this. <laughs> and if you think that I am young on this picture, what would you say of the next one? This picture was taken in Casablanca in the winter of 1950. And you see at that time, Claudine, uh, the only difference that Claudine was as big as I am. <laughs> But I think she has not changed besides that. And you see also that for some very strange reason, uh, it, the, the winter in Casablanca is very mild, but for strange reasons, my parents had dressed me already with the overcoat, which is almost ready for the Stockholm winter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for a very beautiful and touching talk. And uh, now we continue the program. <clears throat> and the next speaker will be David Weinland. David Weinland was born in 1944 in Milwaukee in uh, the United States. He got his PhD in 1970 from Harvard University, Cambridge. 
His group leader and NIST fellow at the National Institute of Standards and Technology and a lecturer at the University of Colorado Boulder, USA. David, the stage is yours. So, well, first of all, I'd, of course, like to thank the Nobel Committee for inviting me here. <laughs> and uh, I have to say, I, I think both Serge and I agree that uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful honor, but uh, it wouldn't have happened without many great colleagues and, and also the work of, of, of people in many other labs. So uh, you're, you'll hear this a little bit the same story again. This is my version of, uh, of kind of the, the, the Schrodinger cat. So, uh, it, it, you know, I, I always one had great admiration for someone like Schrodinger, who, of course, was one of the inventors of quantum mechanics. But at the same time, he was willing to think ahead, and, and uh, he was dissatisfied with the theory and the and the, and the reason, basically, is that if you take uh, quantum mechanics alone, we're used, we're, both Serge and I and others are, are used to thinking about very small systems, single atoms, single photons. But uh, the, the, the theory should apply to very large systems. And uh, early on, Schrodinger realized that. And uh, he, he to, to explain his, the problem he had, he posed this example where... Uh, uh, a cat and uh, a radioactive particle were in a in a sealed box, so that it was a closed system. We say, and in any case, the, his example in this his example, the if the particle decayed, it would uh, trigger a mechanism that would release poison and kill the cat. Well, in fact, of course, we can't write down the equations of motion for the system, but uh, it'd be too difficult. But in principle, we can. And basically, all quantum mechanics tells us is that. The, after uh, a time equal to the, the so-called half-life of the particle, all we can say is that the, uh, from quantum mechanics is that the, 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 the state of the system is where the, the particle has not decayed and the cat is alive uh, and not or, but and the particle has decayed and the cat is dead. And we represent this uh, mathematically with the, these symbols here, but the but the, but the key thing is that all we can say is that the cat is neither dead n nor alive. It's both. Uh, so that was, of course, what bothered Schrodinger. Now, one thing, I, this idea of superposition, uh, which the Schrodinger cat is a good example of, I think. Uh, I, I like this example. Uh, Chris Monroe found this book when uh, he was uh, in our group and... Uh, Anyway, it, 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 I think it's a, it's a really nice example. You can think of, if you think about this box uh, up here, and if you, of course, play with your eyes, you can either see this surface here be in the foreground or, this, uh, or the, the surface on the upper right be in the foreground. And, uh, so you tend to see either uh, this surface in the foreground or that surface in the foreground. And, and what's, I think it's a useful analogy because this, in this picture here, it basically has both properties. Uh, uh, so, and, and this is what we call superposition in quantum mechanics. There's some ambiguity about which state the box is in and, and actually possesses both properties simultaneously. Uh, the, the other thing is that uh, when, we, when we talk about doing measurements on quantum systems, we it's called collapse or measurement projection. And this example also t uh, shows that, I think, in a nice way. Because when you look at this box here, and you, for example, at, at an instant, you might see this surface be in the, in the foreground, like this picture here. That's very much like measurement in quantum mechanics, even though uh, the, in, the, in the superposition state, the, the box has both properties. When we measure it, uh, one feature will, will come out. And that's very much like uh, measurements in quantum mechanics. And then we talk about entanglement in our system. And, uh, 
And so if you'll at least open to suggestion here, the idea is if you have two uh, boxes like this, uh, at least for me, I tend to see if I see this, this surface be in the foreground like down here, I tend to see the other surface also be in the foreground. And so when, when we measure these entangled systems, there's a, there's a correlation. So in this example here, when, if we measure the, this surface to be in the, in the foreground, then we tend to see this surface also be in the, in the foreground. And so th this, this analogy uh, it kind of a, com uh, explains this idea of this uh, entangled superposition. And just coming back briefly to, to Schrodinger's the cat, uh, if we... Uh, to show the entanglement, we, we call this an entangled state where the, the, uh, the, we have this correlation of the, the particle not decayed and the cat alive and the particle decayed and the cat dead. And those, those, if we see the particle when we do the measurement uh, uh, undecayed, then the cat is alive and so on. So, well, anyway, of course, as I say, Schrodinger was bothered by this, this consequence of the theory and, and he really struggled with this, you know, throughout his career. And so at one point he, maybe, maybe out of frustration, he said, well, look, at, we, we, you know, we, tend, we, we cook up these situations uh, with simple systems like atoms, and, uh, but maybe, that's, maybe that leads us down the wrong path. And the way he said this is that, uh, so one way out of that, according to him, was that, you know, well, we, we can cook up these so-called thought experiments, but... That's going to lead to trouble, and, be, and, and, and in fact, we can never deal with single atoms or, or molecules, and so and it leads to these ridiculous consequences like Schrodinger's cat. Well, in fact, we now know that, uh, that we can enter this world, and, uh, but uh, we, so far we can only do it on very small systems, but nevertheless, they, I'll, I'll try to... To, to show you that they, they have all the features of Schrodinger's cat. And to, to get to this point, what we need is, uh, uh, we, we, first of all, we need precise control of these systems, and lasers and computers and so on have, have, have helped us to do that. We also need uh, to isolate our small, simple systems from the environment uh, so that these superpositions aren't, aren't disturbed. And so the, the target is here to at least to start to see some of these effects is the precise control and being able to s control small numbers of particles. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, take a s sort of a personal uh, view through this. Uh, I think basically what, what's nice for me in the way the citation read for the award is that basically everything in my career led up to the, to the kind of uh, things we're doing now. So uh, it'll be a, a little bit of a personal story, but of course, again, it's uh, many other people involved this, in this kind of work over the years. So this is a picture of Norman Ramsey's group. I was a graduate student in Ramsey's group. Uh, at the time, he and Dan Kleppner developed the hydrogen maser, and many of you know that uh, Norman here was uh, later part of the citation for his Nobel Prize was this development of the hydrogen maser. So that's, that's me there trying to get close to the boss. Uh, and uh, so, it, so my thesis was to, to, to make a deuterium measure to measure its hyperfine frequency. And, and one thing I always muse over is the fact that I'm probably the only person in the universe that has that number uh, memorized. <laughs> and so anyway, that was a result of my thesis. But anyway, it, it, this was good training in the sense that uh, uh, to get these high precisions in these frequency measurements, we have to have very good control over the, the system's environment, in this case, the hydrogen maser. Also, this, I won't go much into this, but the when the, when the atoms are radiating, they're in a superposition state between the ground and excited state, and these, these, uh, these atoms in the maser would live on the order of the superpositions of the atoms in, the, in, this, in, this hydro, in this deuterium maser would last about a second. This was not on, at the single particle level. This was on an ensemble of atoms that were inside the, the, uh, the, the microwave cavity. So after, after uh, getting my degree, I, I went on to work with Hans Demelt, and 
uh, the, although he was interested in also in, uh, in atoms, and in this case charged atoms, the focus of his work then was to, to deal, uh, do with experiments on, on electrons. And during the time I was there, we developed techniques to, to look at single electrons. So a, a good picture to have, I, I schematically show a, an electrode structure here that holds the the electrons, and you can think about them oscillating back and forth. And a good analogy for that system is you can think about a marble in a bowl that the marble rolls back and forth. Uh, another analogy, which uh, some of you may get, uh, is that the, if we if we can think about this system, this charged electron, and inside of this electrode structure, it, it's it, it's mimicked by a uh, a so-called tuned circuit, an inductor and a capacitor in series. And if we stick this, uh, then this equivalent circuit into a, 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 a simple uh, uh, electronic system where we, if we drive the, the, uh, the, the, the tuned circuit on resonance, we'll, we'll get a current through a resistor which we can read out. And the reason that was, that was interesting to help to, to try to find uh, or at least isolate single electrons in this experiment is that uh, we could basically drive the, the oscillations in this equivalent circuit or this amplitude of the marble in the bowl. And in this experiment here, what we did is we, we started out with seven electrons in our, in our atomic uh, bowl, and uh, we, we drove it just at an amplitude where occasionally one of the electrons would uh, fly out of the bowl, go over the edge, and we'd see this, this step process in time. And, 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 and so we'd see the individual electrons leave, and we got down to this last step here that, was the, that identified a, a single electron, and uh, then we could go on and do measurements on this single electron. And uh, very briefly then, of course, uh, Hans uh, Daimelt and his, and his later colleagues went on to do an accurate measurement of the magnetic moment of, of a single electron, and, and in fact, this led to Daimelt's uh, uh, Nobel Prize, uh, that is, this precise measurement of the magnetic moment of the electron. So at the same time, uh, we, were, we were also thinking about ideas about uh, how, how atomic ions might be used for clocks, coming back to my graduate school work. And, uh, and there was one of the things we would, would like to do is to reduce the temperature of the, of the atoms, in our case, the ions. And so we had some ideas about laser cooling, and at the same time, also, uh, Ted Hinch and Art Shallow uh, had, had some, some similar ideas. They didn't look so similar in these, in these uh, brief write-ups, but they're, in fact, very closely related. Uh, so uh, anyway, at that, after, after my uh, postdoc work with uh, Hans Demolt, I went to... Uh, uh, National Bureau of Standards, uh, which is now called NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, so my first task was to help get the, the atomic beam machine, the cesium beam frequency standard going. Uh, and uh, fortunately at that time, my, my boss, the fellow that, that hired me, Helmut Helwig, uh, uh, at that time NIST or NBS was pretty much of a service organization, at least the part that did the frequency standards. And uh, so Helmut was very instrumental. He kind of beat on the administration to get us some money to start experiments, to, first to do the, the laser cooling, and then uh, from then on apply that to, the, to atomic clocks. And uh, so that was really the start of this business in, in my uh, career at uh, NBS. Uh, and anyway, so... Uh, we, we did some experiments, uh, and at the same time, uh, Peter Toshek's group uh, was doing some experiments, and actually Hans Demelt uh, joined them on this. And what, what's kind of interesting, you'll notice that the, the dates of publication are very close together. We were a little early, earlier than the, the, our paper was published a little earlier than that of Peter Toshek's group, but to be fair, uh, you see that uh, they actually submitted their paper <laughs> a day a day early, so uh, I guess you'd have to say they they were the first. Uh, uh, and and uh, so and one, one thing that was interesting about this is I think 
I, I knew because uh, that they were working on this because I knew Hans Demelt had gone to spend a sabbatical in, in that group. I, I don't think they knew we were working on it, so it was really a, kind of an amazing coincidence that, that, that this work was submitted at, within a day of each other. Anyway, our, in, this, in the experiment at, at, uh, in Peter Tushek's group, the, the evidence for, for cooling was that they were able to hold the the ions into the trap a much longer time. Based on the techniques I had learned, I told you about the induced currents uh, that we could measure of electrons. In this case, we just looked at the thermal currents of the, of the ions in the trap, and we could, if we turned the laser on, we could see the temperature go, go down, which was just a measure of these indu- uh, measured by these induced currents, uh, and we could see the cooling effect in that way. So this was, this was the... The, our group uh, in uh, 79, not, not very long after these first laser cooling measurements, uh, uh, and uh, the, the embarrassing part, I think, at least for me, is <laughs> I, I can see I, I aged a little bit. I, I must admit, uh, both uh, Wayne Itano, who's here, and Jim Burquist uh, haven't, uh, they, they don't look much different, but I think Bob Drowinger over here, who's, who's also here, uh, we we suffered from the ravages of time, I would say. Uh, so anyway, the, the uh, uh, you know mo- moving on, one of the one of the goals was um, at, 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 certainly at, uh, at NBS NIST was to try to apply these uh, these cool ions for frequency standards. The reason that's important is that. Uh, is that we want to reduce what are called Doppler shifts, and one of one of the more interesting Doppler shifts is the so-called time dilation shift. This comes from Einstein's theory of relativity. If the ions are are moving inside this this trap, we call it, then uh, time runs slower for them. This is the basis of Einstein's twins paradox, and so the the laser cooling would be very important for that to reduce this uh, this this time this rate of time uh, shift, and so that was the importance there. But nevertheless, we also wanted to think about getting the number of atoms we were using the clock to very small numbers, and the reason for that is just that we can control the environment much better for, for single atoms or ions than we can for a large ensemble. So in this, uh, in this, what this shows here, that actually the, the first experiments uh, isolating single uh, ions were these in experiments also again in Peter Toshek's group, and they actually were, this made some pictures of uh, single barium ion in this case. Uh, our work was a little bit later. We also went back to the same idea that I showed you with electrons. In this case, we kicked uh, magnesium ions out one at a time by using a, a chemical charge exchange process, but we could we could identify the the, the ions uh, at, the, at the single uh, ion level. You see here the same, the last step in this picture indicated when we had a single ion. So anyway, we, we, uh, we, we carried on, have carried on with these experiments uh, after that, and uh, the idea, again, and this is in the context of clocks, uh, one of our favorite choices was mercury. It had two transitions, one in the microwave region and also one in the optical region that might potentially be used for clocks. So uh, schematically what we had is a, this electrode structure, this kind of donut shaped things and some, uh, some other uh, th- things down here we call end caps. Anyway, the, the, the idea was that uh, if what I show here is an energy diagram and we, if we tune a laser beam such that its radiation connects this lower level to this excited level, then the atoms can scatter photons. And if we tune, the laser cooling process relies on tuning this laser slightly uh, below the resonance frequency of this transition. Uh, the, the thing that made this hard was that this, this wavelength was in the, in the, in the ultraviolet, and, and certainly this is where Jim Burke was, uh, was the key to the to this, to this work because he was the, he's the laser expert and continues to be the laser expert in our, in our group. So the idea of a clock, the way we could make a clock on this, there's another transition 
in uh, Mercury. And this one has the feature that it's, uh, it, it has a much, much narrower uh, range of frequencies over which it absorbs, and so we can get higher precision on the frequency of the laser when we make this, this transition. One interesting thing is that we can use this, this transition that we use for the cooling to detect when, the, when, the, when this transition is made because when, if the ion is promoted from this ground level up here to this particular excited level, then the scattering on this, uh, on this laser cooling transition will, go, will, 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 will be diminished and we can tell then when we make the transition uh, with the laser tuned to the so-called clock transition. At this time, there was, there was a bit of controversy among the, among the theorists about whether if we did this experiment, that is, if we, if we tuned this laser uh, and, and hit this resonance transition, would this scattered light just uh, diminish sort of smoothly or would the atom sort of jump from uh, one state to the other. That is, would, would it be either here or here? And in fact, the, in fact they, the, the atom does jump when, uh, uh, as indicated by jumps in this scattering. So if we promote the atom up here, then the light just completely shuts off rather than be just diminished. And, the, and these, again, the, uh, the same, same people, this was now Damelt's group and uh, Peter Toshek's group and our group that... Uh, did some experiments on this about the same time. So, um, so I have to, uh, we have much fancier versions of these things now, but this will give you an idea of uh, the, the, our, a little movie we made in 86 showing these jumps. So this shows the same kind of electrode structure. This is the donut here, and uh, uh, the pictures get poorer in quality here. The, First, that was the trap just mounted on a penny. This is now looking through a window of a vacuum system, but you can still make out the, uh, the, uh, the ring, the donut-shaped structure and the so-called bin cap. And then this, this picture is taken with an ultraviolet camera whose quality is pretty poor. You can still see the outline of the, of the, uh, of the donut, the inner, inner part of the donut here. And as the movie goes on, you can start to see the, the scattered light from, in this case, this this single mercury ion. And uh, what we're doing here is we're tuning the cooling laser closer into resonance so the atom will scatter more and more photons. But, but while it's changing state, you can start to clearly see the, the atom blinking on and off. And when it's, when it's not scattering, that means it's in this, that, that upper right-hand uh, level. And you can see, clearly see these so-called quantum jumps. So from this work... Uh, uh, we 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 uh, we wanted to go farther. This was this was a way to detect the quantum levels, of course, of the uh, uh, of the uh, that were affected by the lasers. But we also wanted to control much finer level the the, the levels of motion in the in the uh, of the ion and the trap. So uh, if I if you expand the uh, this this black line here. Basically, the, these, uh, the classical picture, again, of the, of the ion and the trap is this marble in the bowl. But in, a, in the quantum picture, what we need to think about are, are the energy levels, uh, uh, the ground energy level when the atom is closest to rest that we can get it uh, going on up with excited, so-called excited states and of the, of the quantized motion. Now, these, the gap between these, these, the first, the ground and the first excited state of the motion is about eight orders of magnitude, about 100 million times smaller than the gap for, this, for the energy of the photons that are driving the laser transition. Uh, so we had, uh, of course, had have much better control to be able to control down to the quantum levels of the motion. So what this picture shows is uh, if, we, if we tune this laser uh, such that uh, when we when we drive the uh, this so-called electronic transition, if we if we tune the frequency of the laser so that uh, it, that uh, the the motional energy does state doesn't change, then we can see a feature here. What this shows is the probability of seeing fluorescence. And of course, when we hit the transition, then the the scattered the probability of the 
uh, of seeing the scattered light goes down, and which is why these, you see these dips here. Well, we can also tune the lasers so that uh, when we, uh, if we start in this, say, this n equal 2 level, we can, we can change the electronic level and also increase the motional quantum level by 1, which is indicated by that feature there. Uh, we can also do the other side, and, and if we go uh, drive the, the electronic transition and also decrease the, the, the motional state by one, we, that's indicated by that picture there. So anyway, we could start to see these kind of quantum uh, features in the motion. And one interesting thing, we could, we could use this, this so-called, these sideband features the, to, to do a further kind of cooling. In this case, first of all, we, 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 the conditions were such that if the, we, after the atom was excited to this upper uh, manifold of states, when it decayed, the conditions were such that it would decay back down without changing its quantum number. So the idea of this further cooling was that we would, we would, we would excite on this, this so-called red side man, the lower frequency transition. So if we, if we started here, we would decrease the, the motional quantum number by one, then we would let the, the atom decay, uh, and we would repeat this process so that uh, if, we, if we excited then there, it would eventually come down to that level. And the interesting thing, of course, is that when we get down to this lower level, then there's no uh, uh, excited energy level, for, uh, motional energy level for this, for the atom to go to, the, so the scattering stops. And, the, and that was then an indication. What you're seeing on this right-hand picture, uh, the, this feature here collapses down into this, this feature here, and similarly this one represents one here. And you can see a big asymmetry now in the in these features, and the fact that this, this so-called red side bend is disappearing means we're predominantly in this situation here where we don't get any absorption, and the atom is then indicates the atom's in its ground motional state as well. Well, anyway, let me just come back a little bit to the clocks. Uh, we got uh, the, with, the, with, the, with the cooling and... Uh, and trapping, laser cooling and, and, and trapping, we could, we could reduce these Doppler shifts and taking some other care to reduce other collision, uh, other uh, perturbations to the system. Uh, Jim Berquist is the main person that has led this work, and uh, this really started in 1981, and uh, his experiments on, on mercury were the, actually the first uh, clocks to exceed the performance of the of the cesium beam frequency standards, and nowadays we all think about uh, uh, optical clocks uh, uh, rather than microwave clocks in terms of high performance. Anyway, so uh, around uh, 1995, uh, uh, these ideas of quantum information processing, more commonly referred to as quantum computing, came around. Uh, there, there were some early ideas by people like Richard Feynman and others, but uh, they, were, they were just kind of toy ideas, I would say. And then what really set the field off was that the Peter Shore uh, computer theorist came up with an algorithm that said if you could make this quantum computer, uh, you could efficiently factorize large numbers. The reason that's important is that if we could if we could accomplish this task on very large numbers, that would have very important uh, implications for uh, encryption and uh, secret coding, basically. Anyway, uh, not long after uh, Peter Shore uh, made, uh, announced or uh, described his algorithm, actually uh, Art Record, who was already a, an accomplished person uh, in uh, uh, doing uh, quantum uh, communication, uh, came and gave us a lecture to the atomic physicists uh, uh, on, on this, presenting these ideas of quantum computation. And, and fortunately, uh, both Peter Zoller, who's in the audience, and, and uh, uh, his protege at that time, Ignacio Serac, they, uh, they, they quickly jumped onto this idea of, of, of quantum computing, and they came up with, really with the first scheme for how you might build a quantum computer, and it was based on ions. 
So the idea is here, this, is just, this picture is just to represent some sort of electrode structure. You can still think of the marbles in a bowl in some sense. Uh, in this case, it's kind of a linear bowl where the, the ions all want to follow the bottom of the bowl, but the Coulomb repulsion, due to their charge, holds them apart. Anyway, their idea was that uh, you, in, in this example of five ions, it's kind of like a pseudo-molecule. You can think about the normal modes, the vibrations of the molecule, and they all have different frequencies in general. So you can think about the, the ground and first excited state of, this, of, the, of one of these modes of motion of the molecule. Also, uh, as what we call a quantum bit, in other words, a two-state system that, we're, that can that can represent uh, Im information. And their idea was that, uh, uh, that you would use the internal states of, of ions. They could be either optical states, like I showed with the clocks, or hyperfine states. That in principle, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, their idea was to, to be able to make quantum gates uh, if we could, if we could uh, with a laser beam, if we could somehow map this superposition state onto this motional state uh, uh, then we would, then we would, uh, this motional state is interesting because it's shared with all the ions. All the ions share one motional mode. And then the, to make a gate then uh, uh, between the two ions, you'd first do this mapping step, and then from, on a second selected ion, you'd do a quantum gate between the motional mode uh, and the internal state of this ion, which is then basically have done, made a gate between the, the first selected ion and the second selected ion. So uh, I won't uh, give you details of exactly how this works, uh, uh, but I give you kind of a sense of how logic gates work. So if we have this, in this case it might be an optical transition, uh, uh, and, and if we isolate these two lower uh, motional quantum levels, which also represent a quantum bit, then uh, one way you can kind of get the idea of how a logic gate works is if, if we uh, have a truth table down here. And the idea is that if, if this, this, this bit uh, representing the motion uh, is, is called, the, if we refer to that as the control bit, and this is the, this is the, quant, the so called target bit, uh, then the idea is if we, if we tune to this transition where the where we reduce the quantum number by one, then the idea is if the control bit is in the n equal one level, we can do this transition. In other words, we flip the the bit of the of the target the target bit. If it's uh, if it's in the ground state, again, there's no place for this to go, so the the, uh, the the target bit doesn't flip. So we get this kind of logic table. And this was a little too simple. Uh, but the, it sh gives the essence of the idea of this logic gate. Anyway, so Chris Monroe, who was in the group at that time, we, uh, it, it, you know, we could, we were kind of poised to do this, so we could jump on this idea right away, and we were able to demonstrate uh, a, a more a, a more general logic gate that that, that both Ignacio and uh, Peter had described. The one thing I want to say is that uh, for both. Uh, uh, Peter and Ignacio is that, that this really stimulated the the ion trap field, and this is the I, uh, by last my last count the number of the people working on just quantum information related experiments with just with ions, and of course there's many other implications uh, possible implementations of of uh, of uh, quantum information, and and so this, but anyway both. Peter and Ignacio have gone on to stimulate a lot of work in other areas as well. So um, I could see I didn't give myself enough time here, but let me let me give the a little version of another version of Schrodinger's cat. So you think about this marble in the bowl. What we can do is that uh, we can first uh, start the 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 atom in its ground internal state. Uh, we can then apply radiation to make a so-called superposition of the of the ground and excited state. Then what we can do is that we quit using so-called optical dipole forces, we can apply a force uh, to, the, to, the, to the atom, but it's, it's a force which only acts on the, on the upper state, not the lower state. So we can, we can start to separate the, this, the superposition uh, both as well as in terms of the what we call the spin, represented by the arrows, but also the, 
the position. So we can apply a beam that, that starts to push the, the up component and it's oscillating back and forth. And then we can flip the spins and then we, we uh, apply the same force again, but we can apply it with a, a little bit different phase and we can re realize the situation then where the, the, the a marble is on the, at some instance of time, it's both on the left side of the bowl and right side of the bowl correlated with the direction of the spin and there was the internal energy state. And, and we would say this is like, uh, this is very much like Schrodinger's cat in that we, we have a more classical-like property, the separation of the, of the marbles in, or, or the, the, the positions of these states in the bowl uh, correlated with a microscopic property that is the, the, uh, the, the internal state of the atom. So this is a picture of the trap we use. Uh, and this, uh, very much like what uh, Serge said, uh, we, we can't make a very big uh, cat in this sense. In fact, the, the, the wave packet size of the, of the, in this case, beryllium ion, uh, we could make the, the cat state be such that it was about eight times the size of the wave packet, which is still very small. Uh, and in fact, after this paper was written, we got a com there was a, co a comment in letters to the editor, and, and we called a Schrodinger kitten, but he, he, even he, this fellow, uh, Andrew Algren, said that, uh, uh, well, even that's too big to call it a, anything like a Schrodinger cat. And uh, uh, so he says, call it a Schrodinger furball. And I think it, what, I, what I took from this was, I, I think this is interesting because if it's, if it, I think it does have all the f same features as Schrodinger's cat. And if it's, and if it's, if it's not big enough, how do you define big? And I think none of us know how to define big. That is, where does it, where does the, where do you, where does the classical behavior overtake this quantum behavior? And I think none of us know the answer to that. So let me just say briefly that, uh, you know, this subject goes on in a big way now. Uh, I, I, there's many people working on it. Certainly in our lab, uh, Didi Leibfried led a lot of the early uh, algorithm demonstrations and continues to do that. One of the things I think most physicists are, look, physicists are looking forward is, to is the idea that these, these simpler systems, forget factoring big numbers for a minute, just even small numbers of particles uh, may be able to, to, to simulate uh, other systems of interest. And one thing is several groups are thinking of is to, I, I talked about these, these oscillations of the marbles in the, in the bowl, and you can think of those as oscillating dipoles. Uh, those can mimic uh, uh, magnetic spins in a solid, and so this is, this is a picture of John Bollinger's experiment where he has an array of, uh, of ions in a, hexagonal, in a hexagonal structure, and this can uh, simulate some interesting spin uh, systems in condensed matter. And, and certainly, the, certainly at the moment, uh, the best performing quantum computer, you might say, is, the, is that uh, of Reiner Blatt's group in Innsbruck. And they're able to actually, at least on a small scale, make a, make a real quantum computer. Uh, that it, so far, we can simulate uh, this quantum computer on a classical computer, but I think we're I think we're all feeling now we're getting to this threshold where we're going to get to systems that we can't simulate on a normal computer anymore. That is, we're, we're really going to be able to use this quantum computer. And of course, there's many, many more people working on this, as I indicated. I'm not, I, since I, I know I'm running long, let me just say briefly, uh, we've gone on to use some of these ideas, uh, uh, th these simple quantum uh, information ideas in our clocks. And I regret that I won't have time to give full credit, but uh, in our lab, uh, Till Rosenman leads a project uh, using aluminum ions as a clock. And I, I won't go through all my punchlines here except to say that uh, now this, this clock that uh, Till Rosenman uh, has developed is, is, is the, the world's most accurate clock in the sense of getting rid of these environmental perturbations and in fact we can see some interesting gravitational uh, shifts in the in the clock and this oh heck I'll, I'll, I'll have to indulge you and 
ask your indulgence, and we have a little cheesy movie here which shows this is one of the aluminum clocks on this optical table, and James Chow here uh, raising it up on a jack, and when we did this, we could, we could, uh, we could, we could measure the so-called gravitational redshift, uh, gravitational potential redshift in this experiment, and by raising the, the table about 33 centimeters, we would predict the a shift like this, and we measured at least within the air or something like this. And this may lead to a new kind of, 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 of way to, to measure, uh, to do geodesy, and we're looking towards that. So let me, I, w- I will stop now, sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, I, I do want to, again, you know, I think, uh, want to thank uh, my, my local colleagues, uh, uh, John Bollinger, uh, uh, Jim Berquist and Bob Drawling and Wayne Atano and I have been together around 30 to 35 years uh, uh, and we're still working together and more recently Dee Dee Leibfried and uh, Till Rosenbaum have joined us and Chris Monroe was really instrumental in these experiments that I, that I briefly described and, and of course it's, you know, it's really hard to give proper credit but we've had over a hundred students, postdocs and visitors over the year and certainly we've We've enjoyed uh, really, really good support from our bosses. And particularly, I want to acknowledge Catherine Gebby, who's the head of the lab. She's my boss's boss, and, and she's been very supportive of this kind of work. And I think you know, uh, certainly her success is maybe partly measured by me, but also Bill Phillips and Eric Cornell, Jan Hall, who also received uh, Nobel Prizes. Uh, she is, has been... Uh, the, the lab director during that time. And finally, uh, of course, it's been a nice, uh, for, uh, you know, have nice friends along the way, and including uh, Claudine and, and Serge. This is my wife, Sedna, and uh, we've certainly enjoyed their friendship over the years. And sorry to go so long, but thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, now we have heard the two beautiful lectures about two laureates, and now we have the superposition of them here on the stage. <laughs> So, if there is some urgent question, please ask. If not, you can meet them in the, in the intermission. Is it some question? Over there, yes. Is there a microphone? <laughs> yes. of this whole idea of doing experiments with, uh, with single uh, particles. Yet he, of course, was the, uh, the originator of the idea of the Schrodinger cat. Were others of the uh, founders of quantum mechanics equally suspicious of the idea of uh, single particle uh, experiments, or was it something unique to Schrodinger, and what was his problem? <laughs> I don't know about uh, all of them, but I think Einstein was dubious too. He had another metaphor. He used the idea of a bomb which is half exploded and half not exploded, which is a similar idea, but maybe uh, got less publicity because the, the cat is more lovable than a bomb. But uh, uh, I think Einstein did not like this idea either. About Bohr, it's difficult to know because you know that his statements were very uh, cloudy and uh, I don't know what he would have said. I am sure he would not have been surprised by the result of these experiments. I don't know what you would say. Okay, I think with this we, we thank the speakers again and in the intermission we can discuss with them. <clears throat> thank you. Again. Thank you again.